We all want to be able to please our partner. And judging from the amount of messages I get from so many of my listeners, a lot of you aren't sure exactly how to do it. Well, now there's a place where you can literally take an online course on how to be a better lover. It's called Beducated, and they offer over 100 online courses curated by the world's top experts. Whatever your sexual preference, there is a course for you. And right now, you can try all Beducated courses for one day for free. Plus, for this month of May, you get 50% off if you use my coupon code, Holly. Start your personal journey to sexual fulfillment with Beducated. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited about my guest today, and I know a lot of you have been requesting her, so I know that you are also excited that she is here today. She started in the industry when she was 18 and then went on hiatus for eight months later in 2016. She has now returned to performing and recently caused a major wave by writing a Twitter thread about abuse in the industry and just basically calling out a bunch of abusers, and the response has been pretty, pretty intense. And, um, I think ultimately is leading us to a more positive place. So let's welcome the beautiful and the very outspoken Leah Gotti. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) How are you? I'm doing good. Doing really good. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. I feel like it was, so Leah and I actually shot together on Tuesday. So that was like, I feel like that was nice because we shot together once before, but that was like on a twisty shoe. Yeah, so we didn't really get to hang out as no, much. No, we didn't like, get to hang out. This was way more fun like, yeah. to create and just like watch you do all of your magic. And you too. The the You can catch grapes in your mouth, which was very impressive. Hey, it took me like a few tries, but I eventually got it. You know what? You <laughs> didn't give up. And that's the most important thing. I never give up. <laughs> So let's start at the beginning. Um, let's start about you getting into the industry and yeah. getting in at 18. And how was that for you? Getting in at 18, it was really kind of just like a spontaneous decision. Um, at first, I was just like hosting parties. And then I just stumbled into like hosting an after party for Exotica and ended up winning Miss Exotica. And then, you know, lots of people offering me things. And so did you start off like modeling then? No. So I was like a club promoter. So okay. I like hosted parties, like danced on speakers, you know, like okay. sold tickets to like concerts and stuff like that. So I was just really deep into the nightlife in Dallas. Mm-hmm. So um, just a little tiny, cute 18 year old, you know, I would host like little after parties. I was just in with the DJs and with the go-go girls. So I just was, I don't know, they're like little girl just following around. Mm hmm. And the owner of the Crown Plaza, he really loved me, and he wanted me to, like, help them host an after party. And kind of just, like, threw me in. Like, we went to the convention to, like, promote the party. And um, the girls, like, we were dressed really provocatively. And some girls, like, as a joke, put me and my friends in the finals round. I think, I don't know if they were trying to, like, be, like, a little mean about it. Like, it was not supposed to end up how it happened, right? So... Like, I went all out. I crowd surfed. I won. And I didn't even do the preliminary rounds, you know? So it was pretty cool. And then I met, like, the disgusting Ron Jeremy. Oh, yes. Ron (laughs) Jeremy. He is, uh... Oh, my God. Very interesting. Yeah. It's actually the first time I ever had met um, a trans model. And I was in the bathroom, and I was like, you're so hot. And she's like, you want to see my dick? And I thought she was joking. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't joking. Wow. And I was like, wow, like really taken aback. But it was like something like I'd never seen before, never experienced. And yeah. Even went to a party after that party. And I was actually crying because like we got there, people were hanging out. 
And then I went to the bathroom. I came out of the bathroom, and all of a sudden, everybody's, like, having sex. And I was so overwhelmed. Like, I started crying. I was like, I didn't know if, like, people were going to, like, expect me to do anything. You know what I mean? And everyone's like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, they took me on the balcony, like, gave me a blunt. And they're like, you don't have to do anything. And I was like, oh, thank God. How long were you in the bathroom for? Not that long. <laughs> well, maybe I was in there for too long because, like, it. I just came out, and, like, it was just wild. Like, yeah. I was just like, oh. <gasps> What, what is happening? Like, I didn't know what to I've, expect. I've walked into an accidental <laughs> swingers party before and been like, oh, this is not what I thought was happening here. I'm Literally. just going to, like, <laughs> see myself out. Thank you. Yeah. It was crazy. But I was still in college at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was still, like, wrestling. I was, like, in school doing my thing. And then, like, the offer came to do solo porn. And I asked the person I was with at the time, like, if they thought that was cool. And they were like, sure, yeah, you should do it. And so I flew to Arizona and I shot with FTV girls. It's like really awkward first time. Yeah, they do a lot of public nudity. How was yeah, that? Yeah, it was just me and him. And he kept wanting me to do like stuff. And he like was recording me like talking on the phone to my mom like real, really in like real time. I don't know. I didn't really have any clue of like what was supposed to be like expected of me. Yeah, I think he likes to really because it's your first time, so he's it. trying to really we, get that authentic experience. Dude, like really, we had done some stuff on the golf course, and he had got sent a letter from that town, like saying like you got to delete that shit. You know what I mean? Um, but it's still all out there. Thank God, like I didn't get in trouble. Yeah, I know yeah. that that public nudity stuff very risky. Yeah, you I would never do it ever again. Trouble. Like, I had went back and shot with him a few times, and uh, yeah, my last few times with that company were not that great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I left like I, in the middle. I was like, I need to be taken to the airport immediately. Yeah, yeah. Was what what awkward. was not so great about it? So actually, my agent had sent me there after I started doing boy girl right, and he was like, Oh, well, he wants to shoot a boy girl with you. Well, midway through the scene, like, I looked up and he was not even recording me. It was like he was fucking me for his own, like, personal enjoyment. enjoyment. And he was like, if I bring a camera, then. Yeah, and I was like, oh, it was in his house. You know, like, mm -hmm. so we're up in, like, this mansion in a gated community. Like, it's just me and him, big-ass fucking house. And I am, like, making up excuses, like, oh, you're hurting me. And he's like, oh, you've taken bigger dicks than this before. You know what I mean? And I was like, no, like, I need to stop now. And, like, called John. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I called my agent, who was John Stevens at the time. I'm just going to say it anyways. People know. Yeah. But um, he was like, yeah, you can leave. And I was like, he needs to take me to the airport. He got me a flight. He got me out of there. But, like, the car ride there to the airport was so uncomfortable. Like, he was, like, trying to, like, be rude to me and, like, you're being dramatic, blah, blah, blah. But as you know, like, I'm not the type of person to, like, try and make do things. So I am very aggressive if I feel like I need to be. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, bitch, fuck you. Like, take me to the airport now. Like, you don't want to fuck with me. Like, I'm not playing. Like, blah, blah, blah. You know? He's probably not used to encountering that. No. I'm pretty sure he's very used to, like, uh, complicit girls. Mm -hmm. People who I think a lot of people in the industry are. Right? I think also, too, especially when you first start. Because it's first time video girls, right? Right. It's you don't know what to expect and exactly. you don't know. And, and it's hard to set boundaries, especially when you're young. Dude, and I had, like, went through a lot with my dad growing up. Like, my person who was acting as my father, like, had me, like, stripping for him and, like, taking pictures of me and stuff. So I had, like, an extra sense, I feel like, when I know, like, something's dangerous. Right? That so, is rough. Yeah, it was fucking horrible. And, like, so I think that is why I am so, like, fuck you. Like, you're not going to take advantage of me. Like, I won't let that happen. Like, yeah. It's so interesting because it can go either way, right? It right. It can go the opposite way. Like, where... fight or you're going to freeze. Right. Type of thing. When did you realize that you could fight back against him? Like... When I was 17, I actually got in trouble because I wasn't going to unlock my phone. So, like, I was refusing to unlock my phone for hours. Mm -hmm. Like, he was, like, hitting me and doing all this shit to try and make me unlock it. And I had sent my passwords underneath my sister's door so she could, like, log in and just make sure everything was kosher, right? Mm -hmm. So eventually my dad got into my phone, and then he was like, there's nothing even in there. And at that point, I was just pissed off, and I was like, well, I'm not a virgin. And I just said it. And he, like, grabbed me by my throat. It, like, started going crazy. And, like, I was, like, on punishment for, like, a day. And there was no school the next day because it was, like, some holiday. And um, then the day that we went back to school on Tuesday, I went to the counselor's office and I was like, hey, like, this is happening. 
I want to call my grandma. I want to get out of the school. I want to leave, you know. And so my grandma came and got me. And, like, right as we were getting my stuff, like, out of my dad's house, it was, like, just, like, as much stuff as I could grab. He's, like, pulling up and we're, like, driving off. And, like, that was, like, the time where I was, like, like, I'm never coming back. So I never went back. Um, But, like, he wouldn't let me talk to my sisters. Like, I was, like, the contact with my sisters was, like, cut off. So it's kind of like. So they didn't live in the same house as you. No, they did. But I left and moved in with my grandparents. Oh, after that. And you right. said he wasn't your real father. No, so I don't even know my real dad. Okay. Um, my mom married him whenever I was like six months old. Okay. And then whenever I was like seven or eight, my mom got really bad on drugs. So she was like out of my life. And it was like her mom and him were raising us half and half. Mm-hmm. And we were supposed to stay that way. But my grandma was like really sick with cancer. And my dad decided to like move us like an hour away so then it was just always with him Mm -hmm. and I had a stepmom she was like only 12 years older than me I even remember like in eighth grade I told her I was like hey I'm scared of dad like I think he's taking pictures of me like when I'm bending over I hear clicks you know like I don't know what I expected her to do for me but she didn't do anything well like as soon as he got home she told him what I said I was getting in trouble for that you know so it's just like okay, I just got to be quiet. And then just kept progressively got more and more intense, like where he was like having me drink alcohol, you know, having me give him lap dances. Like if I wanted to like go somewhere, like I'd have to, it would be like, well, what are you going to do for me type of thing? And then, yeah, like, I don't know. I let it happen for a long time. And the fucked up thing is, is like, he didn't really give me and my sister's attention, right? So I kind of like liked it for a long time. No, it makes sense though, you know? Yeah, like Like, I didn't think anything was like, I knew something was weird, but in my head, I was like, oh, well, maybe it's not that bad. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, Well, that's all you know. I mean, right. you, when you're that young, what you learn about the world, you learn from the people who are raising you. Right. So it's almost like he groomed me into doing those things. Yeah. And then whenever I told my stepmom about stuff that was happening, it was more like, well, you don't need to wear short shorts around the house. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. So she's like victim blaming. Yeah. And she's still with him, actually. <sighs> and like my my acting father told everyone in my family that I was lying and, like, in order to talk to my sisters, I had to say I was lying. So I eventually did say, hey, I made this up, you know. And then I told my sisters, like, at a barbecue at our family's house, like, I wasn't lying. And they really didn't believe me. Like, me and my sisters don't have a good relationship. Because... So the same things did not happen to them? So it didn't happen the same way. Um, but my youngest sister, which is his blood daughter, um, one night when he was drunk, he did, like, lay on top of her while she was sleeping and, like, dry hump her. Uh, multiple times and she was just like pretending like to wake up you know and he had done that same thing to me whenever I was like seventh or sixth grade and I woke up and I was like dad and he's like oh I thought you were his wife's name and like ran into the other room and it was just like never talked about um but yeah my sisters still are like in a weird place where like they want to they don't know if they want to have a relationship with him like they just want him to admit what he's done yeah and he's just like oh yeah uh she's giving me lap dances but that's all he'll admit to like he won't admit to like the other things and I'm like well what more really does there need to be like admitted for you to understand like hello like the things that I'm saying I didn't make up like why the fuck would I make that shit up I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's, it's all right. It's got to be hard for you, too, being a mom now. Oh, dude. You know, can you imagine, like, your children going through that? I think- like, it, I, th- I feel like when we become parents, like, the things that we experience in our childhood become all that more, like, relevant and traumatizing in a way because, like, we imagine the possibility of, like, our children experiencing yeah, that, it which makes is horrifying. Mad. My mom and I, I can't <clears throat> talk to my mom, like, my blood mom. Um, like I see her face and I like get triggered with like PTSD because it's like she knew, well, she knows all the stuff that's happened. Right. And she's like, she does, I don't know if she still does drugs, but she struggled with addiction for a long time. Yeah. And she doesn't ever want to like sincerely apologize. Like she just physically fist fought me like less than two years ago, like on some crazy shit. So it's like she, she, she hates me. It's what it feels like. Like. The person that she wants to, like, blame everything for is me, right? But I've always wanted my mom to, like, just love me. Like, I feel like I've always wanted just my parents. But I've never had my parents, so I've always felt, like, extra. So, like, whenever I look at my kids and I see, like, the minimal effort that my mom has given me my entire life, I hate her. Like, just to look at her. Just to even, like, when I hear my sisters, like, and how my mom treats them, you know, I'm like, how the fuck... 
Like, do you continue to be treating them this way? Why are you so, like, cold? How come you have no compassion for the things that we experience? She's more so like, I was struggling. I was sick. Like, woe is me. I'm like, mm-hmm. bitch, hello? You had three daughters that you just fucking left with a monster. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's, like, no remorse. Like, there's no... I've asked her, like, multiple times, like, can we go to therapy? Can we do this? Like, hey, can we practice having conversations this way? You know, but it never will, like, never will be that. Like, she she always uses me, like, for her lies. And, like, if I tell someone, like, that's not true, you know what I mean? She's the type of person to be like, no, she's the liar. Mm-hmm. I would never do that. Like, she she's willing to, like, ring me out before she'd ever, like, admit her wrongs. Which, like, my therapist was like, she probably has some kind of, like, personality disorder or something like that. Yeah. But she doesn't have, like, she doesn't get medical help. She doesn't seek help. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, she feels perfectly fine the way she is. Yeah. So I think, like, I had to cut off communication. Yeah. Like, with my sisters and with my mom because they don't understand. My sisters are still a little younger than me. So I think that maybe, like, when they mature and they start to go through their own self-exploration and stuff, they'll still start to understand me. Or maybe they won't. Yeah. But, like, I just... I couldn't keep putting myself, like, back in those places. Like, it's hard to stay present and, like, just make new memories because those are just constantly flooding, like, my mind. Yeah. Well, and also, too, you know, the the good thing about getting older is that we get to then choose our own families, you know? Yeah. And you have your own family now. Yeah. So you get to, like, make that your world. Yeah, Yeah. it is. And I think I was feeling guilty a long time for that. Yeah. It's like, oh... Like, I don't have anybody, you know, like, I need them in my life, you know, but I Mm -hmm. don't, Mm -hmm. especially if they're going to hurt me and talk to me in certain ways. I don't want my daughters seeing that. Like, I don't want my daughters thinking that sisters should be, like, the way me and my sisters are. Yeah. We weren't ever taught how to communicate or process things. Mm -hmm. So it's just super unhealthy. Like, cussing each other out all the time, like, really attacking each other's characters. Like, it's never like a how are you doing, like, type of conversation. It's like, will you send me money? Will you do this, you know, type of thing. So I'm sorry. It's all good, that you know. It breaks my heart. It's okay because I'm, I'm, I'm learning, you know. Slowly yeah. but surely I am finding, like, my own little people. Yeah. And I've, I've picked and choose, like, who of my blood family that I can continue to talk with. Like, even with my grandma, like, she's been the person who raised me. Like, just having conversations with, like, hey, please don't talk to me about mom. Like, don't. Please don't bring up anything. Like, if, if you're uncomfortable with something, let me know. But I'd like the the, the availability to talk to you about what I'm working with, mm-hmm. you know. And she's been really cool lately. So yeah. it's been awesome. We took one hell of a fucking tangent. <laughs> I was like, initially, I think I was trying to ask you how you got into porn. And then, whoo, we got deep, we got deep on your family stuff. <laughs> Um, but I'm glad that you feel like you can be open about that because I feel like there's probably a lot of people who can relate. Dude, you know, families real. are hard. They are. So um, let's move on to an easier topic. How did you get into porn? <laughs> yeah, like I said, I shot with FTV girls. <gasps> mm-hmm. And then I just met my agent with Matrix Models. And I was still going to school. And one day I was just like, okay enough here I mm-hmm. left my car I left my dorm room and just took a suitcase and came to California yeah so what was your what was your first like sex scene because I know you did a solo scene first so what was the first actual sex scene first that you did? sex scene I really don't even know was it a girl or boy do you remember if it was girl girl or boy girl I first? did a lot of solo work and then I did girl girl and I think my first girl girl was with Reality Kings with Valentina Nappy. Nappy? Uh, yeah, yeah, Nappy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And no, okay. it was, like, so hot. Like, yeah, she's great. She's freaking sexy. Yeah, she is. That Italian um, accent. So passionate. <clears throat> and I remember her talking to me about how, like, her partner, like, is a chef and they, like, love food and all this stuff. It was really comfortable. We were at, like, this beautiful house in Malibu. You could see, like, dolphins jumping. Um... Yeah, I felt sexy. It was hot. We were just wearing jeans and, like, long sleeve shirts with, like, teabag thongs in front of a fireplace. Yeah, it was really hot lesbian sex. Do you remember who you were shooting for? It was Reality Kings, I think. Oh, yeah, you just said that. Sorry. It's okay. Missed that part somehow. (laughs) My titties are sweating underneath. We were talking about all that. (laughs) It gets hot in here, too, and I'm not allowed to control the air conditioning either. (laughs) Um, So... 
Now you got out of the industry um, for a while and you took a hiatus. Why did you leave and then why did you come back? So whenever I left, um, I basically it was after I had like got hurt by like somebody I was dating that was in the industry, and I kind of like started like getting an- super anxiety, something like that, that I've never felt before, like crippling to where like I couldn't I couldn't work basically. Like anytime I'd be somewhere, I'd be just scared. So I wanted to like just stay with like my friends, and like I was just doing Molly and just partying, and I got like. I just wasn't working, and, like, even my agent was like, I feel like you're not in it anymore, and I was just like, yeah, I am, but I really wasn't. Like, after that conversation, that same day, I literally got all my things um, in the car and went back to Texas Mm -hmm. and just started trying to do, like, normal things. Like, I was working at the golf course, like, just in banquets and stuff like that, Um, but I was working with people that went to school with me. So, like, people knew, like, what was happening. I was also going to ask you, so did you encounter people who knew that you had worked in porn, and did that, like, affect you trying to, like, assimilate into, like, regular life? It did, um, but the person who got me the job was my cross-country coach, and she's always loved me and always, like, just took me under her wing because she knew, like, my situations and Mm -hmm. stuff. So nobody really fucked with me at um, the golf course, I just really went through, like, a bad thing mentally. Like, I threw myself out of a moving car, like, one de- night after work because I was just fucking upset. And so, like, right after that, like, I kind of, like, I told my grandma and my mom, like, I was like, I need, like, some help. Mm-hmm. So I went to the hospital. But I didn't think that they – I didn't know that they were going to, like, try and keep me. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't keep me because my grandma signed, like, a paper saying, like, if I did anything that hurt someone else – like, I wasn't suicidal. I was, like, more so, like, whoever's annoying me, I'd rather kill them and just move on with my life <laughs> type of energy. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, nothing happened. I just, I don't know. I, I, I kept just going through it mentally. And yeah. Eventually, I ended up getting pregnant and, like, moving with him. And it was really abusive, like, I didn't have my own phone. I wasn't allowed, like, I didn't get to work, really. You know, I never, like, did anything by myself. He was super abusive, like, to me, like, in front of his family, and, like, nobody would say anything. So, like, I just started thinking, like, all of my relationships were like that, pretty much. Like, except for one, like, when I was in college before I started, it was not like that. But all the ones after I started porn were abusive. So I was kind of, like, in a point where, like, I was not fighting back anymore. I was just kind of, like, letting it happen. Um, And then after I had my daughter, my first daughter, I was working at a tanning salon. And I was just confiding in one of my friends and telling her about some of the things that was, like, going on. I think I told her, like, oh, he threw a plate of spaghetti in my face, like, you know. And she was just like, wait, what? And I was like, oh, that no, that's nothing. Like, worse stuff happens, believe me. And she's like, no, like, that shouldn't be happening. And that kind of, like, woke me up, right? So you, like, didn't even realize while you're yeah, dealing like, with oh, this he's, abuse. He's not punching me right now, you know what I mean? Like, he's just lashing out at me. Mm-hmm. Like, that it could be way worse, you know, because I was thinking about, like, what happened to me. Bef- when I was still in porn, you know, I was like, at least it's not like that. Right, you know what I mean? right. Um, But it progressed to that. Like, it Mm -hmm. progressed to, like, I wasn't allowed to talk when I was in public. Like, getting punched in the face in broad daylight. And, like, you know, like, when you're around people and it happens and then nobody says anything, it's kind of like, okay, well, maybe I'm just being dramatic, you know? That's that's gaslighting in the extreme. Yeah, so that's kind of, like, how my mind was working. Um, But eventually I started, like, putting money away in a jacket. Like, I, I just was... I don't know. I don't. I didn't think I was ever gonna leave per se. I just was putting it there so I could have it in case something bad happened. It sounds like there was a part of you that was yeah. Like I, to, I tried to, to leave. I left three <clears throat> times before I finally left. Yeah. But every time, like he talked me back into coming back. Yeah. And then like one day I was about to go to work and it it just hit the fan and I was like, it's just time to go. Yeah. You know? And I just left. And thankfully I had that money. You know? Yeah. Um, but it was really crazy. Like, yeah. that's whenever I was with him, I was, went on that cho- talk show for the Christians. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So tell us a little bit about that. 
So in that time, I was actually going to church with his mom, mm-hmm. um, Seven Day Adventist Church, mm-hmm. and like uh, he made me dress like super modestly, like. I, he would call me like a dirty whore like all the time like I hated myself like I was even like hallucinating sometimes like whenever I look in the mirror it would be like a different face and like I just didn't I don't know I was just like I was going to church a lot and then one day I was walking into his mom's room before church and I heard her and her sister on the phone talking saying just don't bring her you know and it hurt my feelings a lot Mm-hmm. And I was like, but why? And she wouldn't tell me. And then she finally told me. And I guess like some teenage boys at the church had recognized me. And like they were. From the porn that you did. Yeah. Before. Passing that around in youth group. And they just didn't want me coming anymore. So I was like, I'm not even doing anything. Like I'm a good person. Like, okay. So then I like. The show was looking for stories, and I reached out, and I was like, I have a story. Like, just because I did this, I'm not a bad person. Of course, they edited it, like, and took out big chunks, like, of things that we were talking about Mm -hmm. and made it look a lot, like, more like I was slamming the industry. Mm -hmm. But, like, I wasn't talking bad about the industry at all. I was talking about what I experienced while I was Mm -hmm. in the industry. Right. Like, the, the stuff that was happening to me, like, wasn't on set. The stuff Mm -hmm. that was happening to me was, like, when I was offset because of the people that I was, like, running around with. Mm -hmm. And how that, like, made me feel like nothing, basically. Right. And, like, how I was going to my Christian school, like, when I was in college. And when they found out that I was doing it, like, how I was being shunned. And, like, how every time I, like, tried to come back into the church, I was basically being rejected or, like, made to feel like I didn't belong there. So my goal with that was to make people see that I am just a normal person. Like, just because I did that, like, just because I did porn, like, doesn't mean that I'm not a good person. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. That's, like, one of the most frustrating things to me because I've heard stories like this before. You know, there's so many – I mean, we see these comments all the time. Like, go get a real job. Get out of porn. It's ruining your life. And then some people leave porn because it's not suited for them or whatever their reasons are. And then they try to get a real job or they try to, you know, go back to church or whatever it is. And then they get rejected from these places that they're supposed to like, I mean, I would just say I've, I'm not religious at all. I've never been to church, but I assume that that's a place that's supposed to be accepting and welcoming and like embrace you. Yeah, they don't. Which like, I mean, where are you supposed to go if like Especially you're when you tr- don't have family. Yeah, like, and like I thought the I whole like thing about Jesus is that like he forgives <laughs> you and like you just commit you admit your sins and then he's like, Welcome home, child. No, like what I've realized is like <laughs> that's all basically like a facade people put on. I'm sure there's good churches places, right? But religion is just not a thing for me. I yeah. feel like I believe in unity and like people being one and just spending like love and light and like making choices that would never hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. Just trying to be like the best you can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I grew up Southern Baptist and, mm-hmm. you know, like I've read the Bible a lot and like I always felt guilty. Like even when I was younger, like if I were to like have told a lie, I would get sick and cry. I'd like wake my dad up and tell him the truth. You know what I mean? Or like, um, If I'm talking to, even now, like if I'm talking to my husband and I say something stupid like, yeah, and my friend even said that. And if if it wasn't true, like a few minutes later, I'll be like, I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry that I, like, that wasn't true. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I still get that impeding guilt. Yeah. I feel like that's what happened to me with religion. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to go to hell. Like anytime I'd cuss or masturbate, I would cry after and pray to God and be like, I'm sorry. Like I won't do it anymore. Like, please, like forgive me, you know? So you don't believe in – do you believe in God at all? I don't believe in God. I believe, like, I am a God. Like, I believe that, like, I, you, anyone around us are yeah. our own creators, right? Like, right. nobody can see the world how we see. Right. I think that we're all unified and we're here for a purpose together, but I don't think I believe in, like, Jesus. I like the idea of, I mean, whatever, like, your definition of what God is, it means different things to different people. Um, but I like the idea of God speaks to you through other people. Your experiences and what you see. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe those lessons are the, yeah, Yeah. that's how I think the word universe to me is like more palatable 
and the word God. I mean, I was raised an atheist, so I was like the complete opposite of you. Right. But um, the word God makes me like kind of uncomfortable simply because I was raised by like a father who was like. Like even when I try and like pray. This is not real. Praying now. Like, you know, like some people are like in Jesus name we pray. Like, I don't think I'm praying to somebody. I'm like just talking to myself. I'm like, yeah. I just want to have like more patience with my kids. I want to be calm. I want to embrace my femininity, but still be mm-hmm. masculine, you know, like talk to my grandpa if he can hear me, you know, like type of thing. But I think like my prayer, even meditation has been like completely shifted within like the last two years. Yeah. There's something about putting out like a certain, I think I can, I definitely feel that people put out energy and that is real, even though we can't see it or like hear it yeah. or anything like that. And I think that the energy that you put out, people feel it. And so doing stuff like praying and meditating and stuff shifts like your personal energy. And I think that that people pick up on that 100 percent. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about um, what's happening now in the industry and so much more. So stick around. We will be right back. This episode is brought to you by Beducated. We all want to be able to please our partner. And judging from the amount of messages I get from so many of my listeners, a lot of you aren't sure exactly how to do it. Well, now there's a place where you can literally take an online course on how to be a better lover. It's called Beducated, and they offer over 100 online courses curated by the world's top experts. Whatever your sexual preference, there is a course for you. Maybe you need to start at the beginning and work on your own sexual confidence. Yes, there is a course for that, where you can address your own poor body image and harness the power of unlearning those deep, indoctrinated feelings of shame. Or maybe you want to venture into something new and exciting, like their Yoni Massage course. This is just the start of all the valuable information that awaits you on Beducated. And right now, you can try all Beducated courses for one day for free. Plus, for this month of May, you get 50% off if you use my coupon code, HOLLY. So go to beducate.com to learn more, but don't forget to use my code HOLLY for your special offer. Or better yet, click on the link in the episode description. Start your personal journey to sexual fulfillment with Beducated. All right, guys, we are back. So, Leah, let's talk about... Let's talk about the Twitter thread Yeah, um, that kind of catapulted you into a lot of conversations happening right now. Yes. So let's talk about what prompted you to write that tweet, maybe kind of what was about, because I know it's not there anymore, and then why you ended up deleting it. Yeah. So originally, I just woke up, <laughs> and I was just scrolling through IG, and I seen two really big influential profiles right now in the industry posting on Women's Day with my abuser and I was just like are you fucking me right now (laughs) like this has got to be a joke especially because one of the companies I mean one of the persons was a company who of which I was contracted through all three of their sites when they first began Mm -hmm. for interracial and for anal and for Mm -hmm. just boy girl so they knew what had happened to me you Mm -hmm. know and it was back when the old person who originally started it like was running it And they, like, he had promised me, like, oh, no. Like, I feel like a lot of companies, except for two companies, told me that they would not work with him ever again. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, whenever I took my hiatus, oh, they're like, oh, she's gone, basically. Like, who cares, right? Right. And um, so I just was like, I'm going to post it. Because back in the day, I didn't really talk about it that much. I just kind of, like, I was embarrassed. Um... And I was afraid, like, of what would happen to me, like, if I did say something. Because I didn't know about it. Yeah. So I just was like, all right, well, then I'll post my federal restraining order, my state restraining order. I'll post, like, the document saying that he went to jail for 186 days. I'm going to tell them people, like, what he did to me, what he did to me on multiple occasions. You know what I mean? The situations he put me into. And maybe somebody will listen, right? Um. One of the persons who posted him uh, removed him from her post and apologized to me. It was like, I just didn't know, which I know she was new, so there's no way she probably would have known that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But my abuser last year had just beat up another girl, and Mia Moore, and she posted, like, her face. You know what I mean? She deleted it quickly, but 
people know. Like, he had abused multiple girls before me. Um, his agency knew about that. Like, I had spoke to his agent when he was in jail and was like, what the fuck? And she was like, yeah, he's done it to this girl and this girl, you know. I thought he was better. And I'm like, why are you still giving him this clout, you know, keeping him relevant, you know? Um, I reached out to that company, and I was like, why are you doing this? And their response to me was basically along the lines of, we were under the assumption that you and him were fighting each other. I was like, are you serious right now? Where did you get that assumption? You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, it was basically just like, fuck you. You Mm -hmm. know, we're going to still work with him. Well, they said we're not going to work with him anymore, but we have a catalog of things that are still going to roll out with him, Mm -hmm. is what they said to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, okay. And then some girls, like, were starting to talk to me um, in my DMs, like, oh, I experienced this and this with him, and I also experienced this with this company. And I was like, wait a second. Like, if it's – because it had been, like, six girls at that point telling me, like, things that had happened. So I was like, all right, well, then I'm just going to post a thread. Like, on Women's Day, if you want to talk about abuse, like, put it below so people can be aware. Um, Nobody was really saying anything. So I was like, if you want me to post it for you, send it to me, and I'll post for you anonymously. And then boom, like DM after DM after DM. And I was literally sitting there for like 12 hours a day, like going through what the people were saying and taking out I and me and changing it to she, he, you know, they, Mm -hmm. you know, was really consuming me. Like I couldn't sleep. Like my husband was like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, it has to be done. Like this is insane. Like people know that this is happening. Stuff is happening on set. People are getting put with monsters and they think they're okay because of the people that are, you know, basically praising them. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, something has to change. So I I was doing it and then like, I don't know, I guess some people were starting to like lie, you know? Yeah, unfortunately you're always going to get that. And right? I said- Not if, everybody's truthful. Right, and is- I, I told the people, if you think you're being lied on, send me the proof that they're lying and I'll delete it. And some people were sending me proof that the people were lying, you know, yeah. videos and things like that. And I spoke to a few lawyers and they're like, yeah, just put allegedly in front of it and you should be good. And then uh, I started getting like cease and desist and like, what's your address? Like, where do you live? I'm like, fuck you. I'm not going to give you my address. Like if you want to sue me, pay for an investigator to find my shit, you know, type of energy. But then I started getting threats and then I started getting like more things like from people from like accounts with like no followers, no faces, just like the stuff that was being said. I was like, am I putting my family in danger? Yeah. It's like at what point like are you supposed to be the person responsible for everybody else's right trauma? And it's like it's that hard line to walk right between wanting to help people like you know, talk about the abuse that they've encountered and to out people who are abusers. And then like, how much of that do you have to consume and deal with? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I was crying like a lot. Cause like the stuff I was reading was just like beyond imagination. Yeah. And I'm a very empathetic person and I get angry too. Like when I feel like, um, if people are being complacent to abuse and like continuing to allow it to happen, cause yeah. it's like, do you not, understand like how like detrimental this can be to somebody yeah mentally and physically and I was really angry but I was just in the bathroom like on the ground crying and my husband was like I think you should just delete it like he's like two million people have seen it you know what I mean like people people hear you you know just delete it you can't do this anymore and I was just like I can like I I can do it like I'm not scared of these people, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, it's not that you're weak. It doesn't make you weak because of this. Like, but you have to put yourself first. And your family, too. Because it's not just about you anymore now that you're a mother. Yeah, it's like, this is affecting you daily. You know what I mean? Like, you can't be sad and be a good mom. You know what I mean? No, you can be sad and be a good mom. But the way he was saying it, you know, made sense. Yeah, of course. And so I deleted it. And 
then like people like you and other people were like reaching out like saying how you know this thread has made them like reflect on things that maybe they have done and like what could they make better and basically I just started doing podcasts trying to talk about it in hopes that like okay I don't have to necessarily call out everybody but at least maybe I can call out the behaviors and recommend things to change those things Mm -hmm. and I think People, like, even, like, Mind, uh, I think it was Mind Geek, like, released a, st- a statement, like, like, they don't even, they're not going to be allowing camera offset, like, I mean, you know, off camera sex. Like, when they say cut, it's cut. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like, some people might not be able to say, oh, I'm not okay with this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I've definitely heard stories from girls who, like, you know, guys come into the shower, like, after they've done the scene and try to, like, fuck them again. And they're like, we're done. Like, we're not. I had so many of those. You know, and, like, or, like, in between. Yeah, and just. The tr- girls, like, even, like, yeah, on some of these big-ass sets where they have, like, 40 to 50 crew members, you know, and their P- PAs are, like, shit. They're just down there just eating food. They're not with the model, you know what I mean? Like, the girl just finished makeup, and there's nobody upstairs, and then they're in the bathroom cleaning up, and then, boom, mm-hmm. the talent's just, like, forcing themselves on them. um, Or, like. When they express, like, their nose, like, some directors, like, trying to get them to get anal for free. And, like, even, like, I've been, like, on set recently for a girl girl. And they came up there during hair and makeup. And they're, like, are y'all cool with butt stuff? And the girl was, like, yeah. And I was, like, are you going to pay my anal rate? Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're saying no. And I, like, looked at the girl. And she's younger. And I'm just, like, never say yes to that. Yeah. Come to find out that same company was shooting with another girl, and she posted in her close friends, like, they want me to do anal, but do I ask for more money? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) Like, they're just trying to take advantage of you, like, not having any experience. Like, they think they can get away with this shit. That's how they're always operating. Like, Mm -hmm. not everybody does that, but most companies are doing that sleazy-ass, slimy shit still in 2023. Yeah. Are we talking about like smaller companies no. or like some of the bigger, the bigger the brands? The biggest company. The biggest company with the most wins at AVN last year. Like huge companies that people like would basically die to shoot with because they mm-hmm. think that it's going to make them like a star mm-hmm. forever. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I think I know who you mean, but I'll, I'll find out after the podcast. <laughs> yeah, you know who it is. <laughs> yeah, I think I do. That's... Yeah, I mean, I'm so, like, in a bubble, you know, because I only run my own sets, and I've only worked for one company for, like, the last It's like 12-hour day. Like, they try to keep you on set for, like, 12 hours, and they don't want to pay you anything extra than your rate. Yeah. I was even shooting with this company, and I expressed to them before I got there, um, I'm not staying longer than 10 hours. Yeah. So if you want me there, I'm leaving. Yeah. And we're cut- getting around, right? And I'm like, I have 10 more minutes. Like, yeah. I'm leaving. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they are like, we have to rush through this, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I don't care. Like, if you're not going to pay me more, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here for 12 hours, like, away from my family, not getting paid extra when I could go on a set, another set for, like, four to five hours and make the same money. Yeah. Like, I don't care about your clout. I don't care about your views. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'll get them by myself. No, I mean, honestly, as a producer, like, I'm so with you on that because I've done, like, ridiculously long hours for companies and they, same thing, like, I'm not getting paid more money either. No one in the crew is getting paid like, more money. let's get money. a macro shot. Let's get this it's all shot. Like, let's get all this <clears throat> shit and then cramming it in for, like, the least amount of money. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and there are definitely some directors and producers who run really inefficient sets, so they take a long time because they're, like, very bad at planning things out. But I was, like, I tried to be really meticulous about that and make sure that, like, everything was going a certain way and that we shot things in an order that make the most sense for people and had people on set for the least amount of time. But, like, looking back now, and it honestly wasn't until after I had a child and I became – I began to value my time more. And this is probably what happened to you too. Exactly. After I had a kid, I was like, oh. I'm missing out on things. Yeah. My career is actually now not the most important thing to me anymore. Raising this baby is and not missing her childhood is. And it totally changed my perspective. And And people told me. me away is worth more. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't want to. Like before when I went on maternity leave, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. After maternity leave, I'll come back like in three months. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I'll be like, same as I was before, same amount of days, hours, like I'll do it. And then after I had the kid, I was like, no, actually I changed my mind. And yeah, I just, you know, these, these crazy long days it's revolutionary, honestly. that, that's, that a lot of these brands were pushing and not paying anybody more money. I mean, there was a certain company that I worked for that I was doing feature movies for them and they gave me such a small budget that I had to shoot like a four scene movie in like two days with dialogue and all this stuff. And like those days ended up being like 18 hours. And that's with me busting my ass, like Hell trying no. to make it as smooth as possible. And it ended up costing, I ended up taking home less money because I, you know, they wouldn't cover like breakfast or dinner for my crew. So they would only cover, I had to pay out of pocket. Cause it's like, dude, I'm working these people so hard. Like it's just bullshit. And I was, I felt angry for myself, but also like for my crew, you know, like that's not fair to make them shoot those long days. And then the next day they have to go shoot again and like Especially get up they're making early. Millions of dollars off their side. Yeah. Like they have the money yeah. to do it. They're just being greedy and selfish. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you remember like back in the day, like models were getting paid hella money to be in magazines. Yeah. And now it's switched. Girls are paying thousands of dollars yeah. to be in the magazines. Yeah, there's certain like Playboy um editions I think like in Europe like in Playboy Yeah, Czech people are paying I or think something you have to pay five to, 8, to get published. Dollars. Like I had some people reach out to me and they're like, "Oh, you want to shoot? You can get a cover." I'm like, "Awesome." They're like, "Oh, it's going to be $5,000." Bitch, I don't have that. I have two kids. I have a retirement that I'm trying to pay for. I do. I have to pay twelve hundred dollars a month in insurance. Like I have like things. I'm trying to buy a house. Like the fuck do I look like? Yeah. Paying you to be in a magazine that you're gonna be selling of my body. Yeah. Like, are you fucking me right now? It's crazy. This is the same thing. Like, before I came back and started shooting, right? I was just doing my OnlyFans, and it was no solo masturbation or anything. It's just titty pictures. And stuff like that while I was figuring out what I was comfortable with doing. Because mm -hmm. I, I was like, I don't know if I can be, like, in, I'm telling you, like, my mental was so fucked. Like, I yeah. didn't think people would think I was a good mom. Like, I didn't think that I would be worthy. Like, I was afraid I was going to, you know, whatever. Fuck yeah. up my kids. Yeah. And um, the biggest company out there uh, offered me, like, they were doing, like, a new website for this magazine. You know, they ventured all into website. And they're like, okay, we want you to do four videos and four picture sets. And at the time I was living in New York, it was going to be two hours driving one way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, can you get me a driver? No. And then they told me the price. And I thought it was $1,000 per hour, right? Mm -hmm. That's what was originally wrote to me in my contract. And I was cool with that. They're like, oh, we actually sent you the wrong contract. And then it was $1,000 flat for four pictures, four videos, driving and me getting wardrobe. And all of that. And I broke it down. I was like, so you're going to be paying me like $250 for that? You've got me fucked up. Like, I don't care who you are. If you're the fucking Pope, I don't care. Like, I'm not about to come shoot with you for $1,000 and do all of that. And they were just flabbergasted that I said no to them. Nobody mm. says no to them. Yeah. Like, anyone. Like, everybody wants that little bunny logo. They want to be that girl. They want to be associated with them like I don't want to be your all-star I don't want to be your your girl of the month and you're going to be treating me like shit like yeah. if you don't have a budget to pay for me then don't fucking offer me shit like I'll shoot the pictures myself yeah and I was the person who came up with the concept to shoot anyways it's like so what is going on and it was hilarious because right after that I started seeing like some of the biggest girls like shooting and, and be, being the girl of the month and I'm like hope it was worth it it's funny because when I was working for them, it was less than that. Dude, I was just like. The rate was less than that. I, I offered them. I was like, would y'all like me to be on y'all's board? Because I think that you could have something beautiful here if you really started valuing the people that you're trying to work with. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to toot my horn, but everything that I do gets views. Like, mm -hmm. I've been like the top on Pornhub when, even when I was not even shooting porn. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know I can make the money by myself. Like mm -hmm. I could open my own clip store and shoot this shit. I could hire out my own photographer. So that's what I started doing. Mm -hmm. I hired out my own photographer, hired out my own, like bought my own sets and did all those things and then started using OnlyFans and boom. Like, and it's so different now, you know, like you have those tools that you can do that and that never existed before. I know. 
That's crazy. And I never even cammed before, ever. So then yeah. I started camming, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, like, it's amazing, like, how the industry has changed so much in favor of the performers, which I think is a great thing. Um, so I want to go back to, like, talks about consent. Um, were there any, the, the Twitter thread when people were sending you stories, right. were there any like common themes or even people that you saw across the stories that you were getting? Oh yeah. Uh, like people, the main names were being mentioned by like five to 10 different girls. Yeah. When most of these girls had like experiences on set, but a lot of these girls stuff was happening at model houses or at parties with these people. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, like, the same narrative. And, like, I doubt that these people just all of a sudden got together one day and were like, I'm going to make up these stories about this person. Yeah, like, it's like when what? there's when there's that number of – when there's smoke, there's fire. It's right, hard exactly. to – And uh, it was really eye-opening, to say the least. What do you say to people who say that these things are bound to happen to people who have chosen to do sex work? My grandma said that to me the day that I told her what was happening. Like once it blew up, when I woke up and I saw that it had had, a, like it tells you the insights, 1.2 yeah. million views. I was like, ooh, whoa. Like, yeah. I didn't expect that, right? Right. I told my grandma, she's like, well, what do you expect? Like when you're doing that. And I was like, well, I don't expect that. Like this is about taking power of your body. This is about owning your sexuality this is about creating art with people who want to do the same thing as you mm -hmm. like it's all about consent yeah you know that's what makes it beautiful yeah like if you want to do bondage if you want to do this if you want to do that like usually those people you know should be there on common things like we're here for business we're here to create beautiful art we're here to just like explore our bodies and share with the world, you know, new ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, well, you know. Yeah. So I pretty much would just tell those people, like, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> That's a good, like, very concise answer. Yeah, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> like, do you, do you not consent when you go out on dates? Like, <clears throat> it's normally just you don't. You don't yes, usually say, do hey, don't. do you want to do this? Yeah. It's more like we're going off each other's energy, but it's different on set. Yeah. We're not here to date, you know? How would you describe true consent on a porn set? I think true consent would be private conversations beforehand. Um, yes, no list that are So private out. conversations between just the performers that the director is not party to? No, or? the director and a um, PA should be there. Okay. But the other talent shouldn't be there. No one else should be there. Got you. Okay, so when you say private conversations, you mean, you actually mean without the talent. Yeah, I gotcha. think that the producer and whoever that porn star's assistant is of the day, because mm -hmm. that's going to be the person to vindicate for them and to say, hey, we're going, we need to take a break or something if they see something happening. Right. If the performer isn't able to speak up when it's happening, because sometimes right. that happens. So I would think that it should be like producer, PA, and the star in a room privately with a yes, no list, go over the things that they're okay with, what they're not okay with, then with the other performer or performers, mm -hmm. then a group conversation mm -hmm. where they all sit there and they don't have to read off the list. They don't have to say, oh, this person doesn't want that. It's just in this set, we're not going to do any this, this, and this, and this, combine all the no's, and all this is okay. Mm -hmm. and just make it to where it's a collectively spoken on that way nobody feels like they're being judged nobody feels like they have to you know be extreme you know or they might feel guilted and saying oh actually i might be okay with that when they're not you know and then having that conversation between the pas knowing like we're gonna stick by what our people say and if the producer starts to forget or if the performers start to forget we're gonna stop in cut like you know mm -hmm. and talk about it again and then start you bring up a good point, which actually I hadn't thought about um, and which we weren't putting into practice too much was the private conversation with each performer beforehand. I mean, I always – I mean, the TA was always there to talk to them and and I think like I guess we – you know, hope that we were encouraging a space where they could say what they were okay with. And if there was something that was on the list that they didn't want to do, but they didn't want the other performer to know that. Um, I mean, we'd always go over the list together with the other performer, but I didn't think about actually having a private conversation 
with a performer beforehand. Yeah, you might feel pressure. No, that totally makes sense Like, now. if one girl's, like, if say I'm doing a girl-girl, right? Yeah. And, or say it's someone else. Someone who doesn't have as big of a name. Someone who hasn't shot. Yeah, maybe you're working with a big name, someone that you really admire. And you hear them saying yes, yes, yes to all yeah. these things. And you're like, oh, I have to say yes so I can be like this person. Right, right, yeah, She's totally. okay with it, then maybe I'm just tripping. You yeah. You know what I mean? Like, same thing. Like, if you're on set and you're doing a boy-girl-girl. Girl, and the boy and the girl are like all yeses. And then you're like, fuck, I have like so many no's. I don't want to be the square. I don't want to be the vanilla. Yeah. I don't want them to like think that the scene isn't going to have enough energy or like something because I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know? Or like if you're saying something and then they might like, <laughs> you don't like that? Or you yeah. know, like, what's wrong with you? Or oh, I love that. You know, mm -hmm. that's happened to me on set before. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be treated that way you yeah know what i mean it triggers me to have bad thoughts or something like that yeah. you know um and then someone might think that that's like funny like how could you be in porn how could you do this like mm -hmm. type of energy yeah no that makes a lot of sense so that's actually a really good point i'm gonna i'm gonna keep that in mind thank you leah <laughs> so what ultimately made you decide to actually come back into porn and i know you shoot mostly for only fans but you're shooting like some stuff for some like smaller studios and stuff like that. So what led you to make that decision? So actually I was at a music video shoot with my husband um, for his music and him and his manager, we were just, well, we were all just sitting in the living room after we had shot and just talking about like things that I had been experiencing. So like I was working in bartending and I had been like, all the bars that I was working with, I was getting noticed, right? Then, like, my bosses were like, oh, we have Leah Gotti here, like, working with us, blah, blah, blah. I was working for a rooftop company, and I was so, I loved it. Like, mm -hmm. I was making great money, right? And then one day, I randomly got called into the office, and, like, we're transferring you. And keep in mind, I was working at a pool, and I was dressed so cute. Like, mm -hmm. I was having so much fun. Mm -hmm. And then I get transferred to working at a Mexican restaurant where I'm supposed to be wearing pants, a collared shirt. And, like, I don't fucking want to be a waitress. I don't want to yeah. be, like, I like being a bottle girl. I like being a cocktail girl. Yeah. Um, I reached out to the owner of the hotel because that's who got me the job. And I was like, what is going on? Like, why is this happening to me? At the time, I didn't even have my ears pierced because um, I have really sensitive ears. So I didn't have earrings. And he came back and told me, oh, they said that you were taking your earrings out to fight somebody. And I was like, fucking what? I was like, I don't even have my ear. I have a phone in my video, like um, a video in my phone of after that conversation, like just me in tears, hysterically crying. Like, uh, why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. You know, then come to find out, he finally figured out, like the girl who is like the manager found pages of me fake pages of me because I didn't have an Instagram of Leah Gotti. I just mm -hmm. had an Instagram of Reagan. Mm -hmm. And that's like when I found out there was like so many pages of me. People. Oh, like fake accounts, like right. catfishing accounts. Catfishing accounts, hundreds. And like people using old videos and like pretending to be me on live streams and like all these things, making money off me. And um, I was confiding into my husband and his manager like, I don't know why people hate me like for this like I don't like I don't think that what I was doing was bad like I don't understand why it is affecting me I had been fired from lots of jobs like transferred randomly from lots of jobs treated differently in lots of jobs like sexually harassed at work like even when I was being a personal trainer at the gym right um my boss pulled me into the office and shut the door turned his thing around it was porn of me like, and he's, like, touching himself through his pants and, like, asking me about it. And I'm just, like, what am I supposed to do right now? You know, so I'm just trying to get out of there safely yeah. type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, like I was saying, like, I was still very not confident in who I was. Like, when I first started dating my husband, I told him, I was, like, hey, please, like, this is who I am. I've done this. But please don't tell your friends that I'm a porn star or that I did porn, right? And he did. Of course, like any guy, oh, I'm dating, blah, blah, blah. Everybody treated me differently. Then every time I talk to somebody, like they're talking to me about sex. They're talking to me yeah. about porn. How did he react when you told him? He, like, because you, did you meet him and he didn't know that? Yeah, you... we just met as normal people. Okay. Um, 
he didn't care. He was like, well, you're an amazing person. Like, you know, you're doing your thing. You're raising your daughter. Like, you know, he was very good. Like, and he helped me. He saw that I was, like, by myself, like, just trying to take care of my kid. Like, I was working, like, two jobs and just doing anything I can to just make her have a beautiful life. Like, mm -hmm. to spoil her and all these things. And we were just talking. And this was, like, after a year of us dating, I think. And um, they were like, you have nothing to be ashamed of. And I think it was just having someone tell me that. Mm -hmm. like that you loved and you trusted that I that loved and knew. I trusted and I knew yeah you know I really did trust them you know what I mean yeah look me in my face and say that doesn't make you less of a person like if you wanted to do that now like we would support you that must like, have been like an incredibly impactful I started moment. crying yeah I, I was like imagine. are you sure like I I I I don't want my daughter to be taken away from me yeah I don't want I don't want her to hate me I don't want to make a choice that's bad like I I loved doing what I did like I never thought it was bad until people started telling me I was bad yeah you know like I enjoyed myself you know I was making really good money like I was having the time of my life until you know I got, fell on my face because of other things and they were just like you should just do it like you have nothing to be worried about like we're here for you and I was like okay so I just started a little OnlyFans and I did that for, like, a year before, like, I even showed my pussy on there. Mm -hmm. Like, I just titty pics. And then mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I'd be down to masturbate. Like, and I was like, do you care? Like, to my husband, I was like, would you think of me, like, any less if I were to, like, play with myself? He's like, hell no. Like, you know, do it. You're hot. You're beautiful. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I was still working normal jobs. Like, when I was doing my OnlyFans, mm -hmm. still bartending and stuff. And um, it eventually got to the point where I was, like, making a lot of money, like, just from my titties, like, 10 grand. Like, I was making that much. And I was like, I don't really need to, like, work anymore. Like, I can just be a mom for my daughter, you know? That's one of the amazing things about, like, doing sex work and having your own platform that I hear from so many mothers is that it gives them more opportunity to spend with their kids. 100%. I was working, like, 12 hours, yeah. four or five days a week. And, like... Um, it completely changed my life to where, like, I was able to, like, just go online for, like, two hours a day and do that, and that was it. So then I was like, okay, well, after I started doing the solos, I was like, okay, I'm going to pay because remember I told you that that company offered me $1,000. I was like, $1,000? I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just pay someone $1,000 to shoot me that way. Mm -hmm. And that doubled my income when mm -hmm. I started doing the – really glamorous things and mm -hmm. I was like putting the money into the Airbnbs and like making my content like content mm -hmm. like from 10 to like 20k a month and it's cool too that you get to like come up with your own concepts and yeah. execute your own vision right Dude, you never I, got to do that before. never and I have like a billion ideas a day like my yeah. mind is constantly going yeah 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 and so that was crazy and I was like you know I don't want to shoot with guys, but I love girls. Mm -hmm. And I love shooting girl, girl. I want to shoot some girl, girl. But I only want to shoot it with companies who've always treated me amazing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, I was reaching out to, like, Jackie St. James. And I reached out to a another company who I thought always had my best interests at heart. And then fucking found out they don't. <laughs> you know? And, um... Yeah, so it's just been very selective with, like, who I'm working with mm -hmm. and, like, the, the talent that I want to work with mm -hmm. and just, like, coming up with ideas that I think, like, serve me and, like, are true with me, like, creating those boundaries. Like, I won't do any, like, sibling play or parent play because that affects me mentally. Yeah. Like, and I never realized it did. Yeah. You know, but I played into scenarios that fit into my abuse that I had as a kid. Yeah. And I was like, I can't be a part of that. Yeah. anymore like because when I'm playing that role it kind of like takes me back yeah into those minds yeah no you got to make sure that you got to take care of your mental health first because that's you know yeah you got your kids and everything all right so I have some questions for my patreon members a couple of them for you um so let me pull that up <clears throat> okay uh so Michael Lee says 
Hi, Leah. Since you called out your abuser on social media two months ago, do you think bringing it up on social media was the right or wrong thing to do? Do you think the industry should have support groups talking about their traumatic experiences on set? Yes, I'm a big fan of the business, and I always want to help and support female performers with traumatic experiences or just mental health issues. I don't regret it at all. I think it was the space that has the most eyes. So I think it was the right space. Mm -hmm. I think it was the right time. Like it was after the Me Too movement, I think kind of like set the tone that, okay, well, we're going to talk about it uh, no matter what the consequences could be, right? Yeah. I think I was just like, if you want to take me there, take me there. Like I'm willing to put myself out there to help people see and help people feel heard. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there should be uh, like – community conversations you know like when we have these big conventions i would think it would be beneficial to actually have real conversations like about these types of things i'm constantly like kind of like voting in new practices and like how we can improve just overall experiences for everyone like a consent workshop or something like yeah, that. yeah exactly you know we have pineapple support and that's who i started getting my therapy through mm -hmm. um it, like, gives you a discount for, like, 12 sessions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think that, like, more people should be, you know, able and talked to about getting therapy options because what we are doing is really, you know, mentally tough. Like, you have to be mentally tough. You have to be able to, like, navigate through the, the webs and, like, not pay attention to comments that aren't serving you and, you know, there's going to always be people out there talking shit. And yeah, there's a lot of stigma around the yeah, industry. Yeah, whatever, you know, some people have a great time. But a lot of us get hate. A lot of us get shunned from families. A lot of us don't have, like, uh, people that you can talk to, people mm -hmm. that you can, you know, you can rely on to give you honest, non-biased, you know, feedback. So creating a place for us to have that. Yeah. I think is important. Maybe even, like, I was thinking about, creating like a website and then having like an odd number of people, right? And then like some people could like submit their claims of abuse because we have these like, I don't know what you call them, unions, but they don't really do anything, okay? Yeah. Um, send it in and then all of us vote. Like if we agree, we'll do our research. And then if we do, then that's a list. And we send these lists to the people. And if then if they are continuing to not only work with these abusers, that could be illegal, mm -hmm. you know? Some kind of like, Thing like that I think would be cool or just like a forum to where people can just like openly talk without yeah so there's like some accountability yeah with no names yeah like completely anonymous yeah with, with ways to type it you yeah know what I mean since you mentioned pineapple support I just want to let our listeners know if they're interested it's a nonprofit organization that provides mental health resources for sex workers so if you want to support them um, you can donate at pineapplesupport.org they're a really important resource for our industry. I've done some live streams where I've donated the proceeds to them. So um, if you're feeling like you want to do something good for the world and bring yourself some good karma, go to pineapplesupport.org and donate. Okay, yes. I have one more question for you. This is a much easier question okay. um, to answer. Hugo wants to know how you stay fit, Pilates, yoga, or running? And I actually know what the answer is, and I think it – ties in so perfectly with your personality <laughs> so i do a little mixture of a lot of things um, my husband has a uh, athletic club that focuses on like race placement and just fitness overall but when you say race placement you mean running running yes yes just running, make sure people knew. um but the race is against yourself you're never competing against other people mm -hmm. that's just like how we try and make our mind mm -hmm. but recently i've been boxing because i am gonna be professionally fighting this summer Woo! did that is like that's so hot and it's so you're so you have such like a feisty personality what like a great outlet for you and also like how fun i did we were talking when we were shooting earlier and i did boxing for five years at box and burn i loved it like changed my life and then unfortunately i got an injury and it was difficult for me right. to go back but it like it changed my mind around exercise like everything i loved it so much so tell us a little bit more about your boxing journey so I used to wrestle in college we talked about that a little bit mm -hmm. um I've always been very aggressive <laughs> like <laughs> always like street fights all fights like taking your earrings out taking my fake earrings <laughs> out like 
I'll beat a bitch up. I'll beat a man up. I don't care. Type of energy all the time, right? And I love, like, I love challenges. I like it when people, like, look at me and they're like, oh, you couldn't do anything. And then I'm like, boom, baby. Mm -hmm. You know? So, like, one of my friends, Minicon, he is an influencer and he's a boxer. He he fights with Misfits Boxing. Mm -hmm. I'm represented by GOAT. And, um, yeah, they just asked me, hey, would you be down to do some fights? And I was like, fuck, yeah. So then I started, I got a, I got a trainer, um, Stoic Boxing, Mateo, and I have Tiffany, who are, like, training me five days a week, two hours a week. I mean, five days a week for two hours a day. And it is literally, like, that's better than therapy for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I get to get aggression out. My husband is coming with me, like, teaching me my mitts. And, like, I told you, I don't really have, like, any family in with me. So his wife and him have, like, basically adopted us. Like, they have kids. Like, our kids play with each other. We spend Easter together. Like, it's just really awesome. Like, so with boxing, I've found, like, my little community. Like, my little, like, ooh, you know. Yeah. Like, we're doing it. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you know where you're going to be fighting? Like, do you have a date yet? Or I have like a date, but I can't say it yet until we have it finalized. But okay. it is this. But are you going to, like, announce it oh, on I'm your gonna platform announce it, yes. so everybody can? It'll be in America, and I'm going to, and it'll be this summer, and it will be on pay-per-view. So if you can't come to the actual fight, you'll be able to watch it. Oh, my God. How exciting. It's going to be so cool. There's going to be, like, a week-long media. You know, I'm going to have to do, like, open workouts, like, talk shit to the person. Like. I was going to say, are you going to do the thing at the beginning where you're like both there and you like yell at yeah. each other? Oh my God, I want to see that. But you know, like that, whoever my opponent is better not try any funny shit because I am not one to keep it cool. <laughs> I'll be nice until you're not nice to me. <laughs> like, no, I've been watching some of them and I'm getting nervous. I'm like, there was one where like this girl like threw water on the other girl. I was like, better not be me. You're going to end up on the floor in start two the, seconds. You're going like, to start the fight early. I hope you got security right there. And I don't know. I'm pretty smart, so I probably wouldn't react immediately. I'd probably wait till everything's calm and we're just like <laughs> right there. To disarm them. Yeah, like, whoops, accidentally fucking punched her in the face already. <laughs> oh, my God. But I, I love it. I think it's going to be epic. Like, <laughs> I love fighting. <laughs> yeah, be fun. I bet. All right, well, I cannot wait to see you fight. I'm definitely going to be watching and, be and team cheering Gotti. for you. Yes, Team Gotti. Oh, my God, are you going to make shirts? Yeah, I'm going to make shirts. Oh. <laughs> I'll send you some. Okay, I love it. I love it. I love it. Send me a little, like, baby one for my daughter. I will. I will. I will. I'll send you one for everybody. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure. And me. I'm sorry for all, like, the traumatic experiences that you've had. But hey, it seems like you're really, like – It's a part of it. You know, and it feels like you're really using that to help other people. And I think that that's the best thing that we can do with, like, the bad experiences that we have. If we can turn it into something Some powerful. positive. Yeah, yeah powerful. like, the, the negative things, ultimately, they just make you better. Like, yeah. you know, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. Like, I didn't really believe that until this year. Well, yeah. yeah. Until, like, I started my healing journey. Yeah. But it is really cool to just kind of, like, flip that switch. Yeah. Like, hey, this shit happened, but it's okay. Because it won't happen again. And if it does happen again, I am equipped with skills to process it in a better way. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yeah, you can find more of me at moreleahplease.com. My Instagram and my Twitter are at loveleahgotti. And my TikTok is love Reagan Lee. <laughs> Perfect. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Make sure that you go check out our socials because we did a really amazing shoot together um, earlier this week. And I'm Epic. very excited. I'm still waiting on to get the film back. I know. I like, ah! to see it. Like fingers and toes and legs crossed. I know. I know. I shot her on a Super 8 camera for my first time. So waiting on that. So really excited when that comes out. And I'll be posting a couple of previews on my Patreon where you can also – Watch these interviews streamed live and get other bonus content. That's patreon.com slash Unfiltered. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, make sure that you like and subscribe. If you're listening to it on the audio podcast, please go ahead and rate my podcast. You can go to ratemypodcast.com slash HRU and, um, you know, leave your review there and your five stars, which, of course, like I deserve five no less stars. than that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next week. <laughs>